In this video, we'll discuss the Greek mathematics after Euclid up until 0 CE. Now, when we think about this time period, we're looking at Greece really going from 300 BCE to 600 CE. And in the same time, as the Greeks are continuing in their work and their development, the Roman Empire is also growing and becoming powerful. So you start to see overlap in what's occurring between the two uh, civilizations, especially as the Romans become more conquering and start to take over places like Greece. Now, Alexandria was still a major hub and an important place for Greek society up to about 30 BCE. And Alexandria University still is a major contributor in much of the advancement of knowledge that the Greeks uh, would put out in those several hundred years. Now, the Romans did eventually conquer the Greeks and the, became part of the Roman Empire. And as time went on, the Romans eventually did split into two parts, East and West Rome, and Greece became part of Eastern Rome. And that last 300 year period for the Roman Empire, there was a slow decline in the work and that was being done as the empire just lost its power as well. And in that time period, you start to see that the innovation in science and mathematics uh, just does not continue like it had in the previous uh, several hundred years before that. And much of the work became much more about compilation and commemoratization of prior works. Now, let's look though at the time period from 300 BCE to about 0 CE. One of the most important and influential mathematicians of all time, Archimedes, uh, lived during this time. And he is considered not only the greatest mathematician of antiquity, but probably one of the most important of all times with Newton and Gauss. Uh, some of his mathematical discoveries included things like the, the principle for the volume of an irregular shape. It said that he was asked to determine uh, whether a crown for the king was pure gold or not. And in sitting in a tub, he jumps up immediately fully naked and yells Eureka and goes running to explain how this principle works about trying to find the volume of in using water. Uh, he also was able to do things like approximate pi by trying to find that the inscription and the circumscription of the shape uh, inside of a, a circle to help determine what pi had to be approximately. He also was able to calculate the area of a parabolic segment, something that is the foundations that we now use in calculus. He's doing using uh, triangles and using their, the midpoint between segments to then create the area of those triangles and make smaller and smaller triangles to calculate that area under that curve inside the parabola. And additionally, he made multiple books uh, on circles and in plane geometry on parabolas, spirals, uh, many different topics that uh, were very influential to the Greeks at that time. Now, he also was an inventor and a scientist. Uh, he created, as we've said before, the Archimedes screw which is often said to have likely been done while he was a student at Alexandria. He also made many different astronomical instruments. Uh, but he also created in very intuitive uh, weapons of war that helped Syracuse last for many years than would have been expected when the Roman Empire came to conquer uh, the Syracuse. One of those was called the Claw, which was on a pulling lever system that, when thrown over the edge of the wall by the sea, it would reach down, grab the boat, pull it up, and slam it, and just destroy the boats. And it was considered a huge technical innovation because it could be run with just a couple men at a time uh, and still destroy fleets of ships as they tried to come to come over the wall. Additionally, there's one that has been controversial towns called the Death Ray, uh, where they would use shined, uh, probably shined, very uh, fine, very bright uh, shields that they could then focus using the shield, the, the ray of the sun as a mirror, and then try to catch boats on fire. And if you think about what boats were made with to keep them ship uh, shipworthy, they would be covered in fat and other things to keep it so that they would actually not sink. And so that is quite possible that it could catch boats on fire. Now, when Syracuse was eventually overtaken, Archimedes was killed in that siege. And Marcus, or Marcellus, from the Romans found Archimedes and felt that he deserved a proper burial. So he placed them into the cemetery after the siege was completed. Uh, and it's said that at his tombstone that there's an inscription of a sphere inside of a cylinder of the same height and radius to be placed on his tombstone because that was considered one of Archimedes' favorite geometrical discoveries. 
It's also said that that grave was neglected for hundreds of years and was found later by Cicero, uh, but it's still not something that is fully known and would likely not be found if you go to Syracuse now to look for it. Now, there are many other famous Greek mathematicians and scientists that were greatly important in this time period. And so we're going to hit a couple of the others, one of those being Eratosthenes, who was the chief librarian for the University of Alexandria. Uh, he was well-rounded, uh, both in maths and sciences, but also in athletics. He received the names uh, Pentathlus for his athletics, for how well he was in the athletics, but also the name Beta because he was often considered second to Plato, or often the second best at everything that he did, because he was so good at so many things, but may maybe not the best in any of them. He was known to have many different achievements, both in mathematics, but also in some of his other works. One of those being the sieve of Aristosthenes, which helps you determine uh, the prime numbers up to a given number n. He also calculated one of those mechanical solutions for the famous problems of the duplication of a cube. So he also found one of those ways that not with the with the classical tools, but with mechanical methods that could duplicate the cube. Now, what, some of the things that we know him the most for though are his creations of the first known map of the world at that time, as well as the measurement of the circumference of the earth and how close that is to the actual measurements of earth, thinking about that this is several thousand years ago. Now, let's look at how he would have done it or how it's said that he would have done this. First, he would have known that there were two cities, Cyrene and Alexandria, that were about 5,000 stadia apart. Now, at summer solstice, because of the location of Cyrene at the Tropic of Cancer, uh, there is no shadow. However, there is a slight shadow at Alexandria, since it's a little bit further north on Earth. What he then can do is calculate what is the angle of that shadow with a stick or something in the ground. And he calculates that at the base, it's about 82 and 8 tenths degrees, which means at the, the top angle would have to be 7 and 2 tenths degrees. Now, why would that be important? If we think about what's going on in our picture here, we end up with the idea of parallel lines cut by a transversal. So we have alternate interior angles with the sun ray. And if you think of sun ray coming through Cyrene to the center of the Earth. And since we know that this angle is 7 and 2 tenths degrees, we know this angle is 7 and 2 tenths degrees, and we can create a proportion because we know the, that the 7 and 2 tenths degrees is out of 360 degrees, something that's commonly known uh, by the Greeks at the time. And we also know this distance on the cir of the circumference to be 5,000 states. So then that can be used to calculate the circumference of Earth. Now, there were other, again, famous mathematicians and scientists at that time, such as Apollonius of Perga. He was said to have studied actually under Euclid at the University of Alexandria and was known not only for his mathematics, but also for his astronomy. Uh, but his most famous work came with the, his book, Conic Sections. From his work with Conic Sections, he is considered the great geometer. Uh, he had over he had eight books with 400 propositions within it, and it went well beyond the works of his predecessors, which included Euclid. Uh, he's the reason we use terms such as parabola, ellipse, and hyperbola. He's the reason why we use the double cones the way we do to consider how the conics are constructed. He also has come up with many other uh, terms and concepts within conics that are important nowadays and are taught even in college geometry courses, such as the Circle of Apollonius. Now, trigonometry comes out of their desire to not only do their work with geometry, which was very important, but then to understand the world and the heavenly bodies that are around them. Now, trigonometry didn't start with the Greeks. Uh, as you can see, back in previous works we've talked about, such as Plimpton 322 with the Babylonians and the Rhine Papyrus, there are concepts of secants and tangents and cotangents. So some of those foundational concepts of trig were there. But what happens is that because the Greeks cared so much about astronomy, they followed the work that was handed down to them from the Babylonians. It, and there is seen to have been likely records from the Babylonian astronomers in the 5th and 6th century passing on to the Greeks. And then they built on that work. And we have many uh, famous Greeks that helped improve both the works of trigonometry and astronomy. Uh, Hipparchus is probably our, 
our last major player that we're going to talk about here at in the BCEs, and he was considered the greatest astronomer of antiquity. And because of his work in astronomy, he also is coined with the term of being the founder of trigonometry because he had to create so many different trigonometric tables and books on chords to be able to understand the heavenly bodies that were around. Uh, that also uh, required him to do much of his work with spherical trigonometry as well. And this allowed him to do many different calculations, such as the length of a lunar month, which is said to be within one inch of what we consider now. He also was able to calculate the radius of the Earth and distance to different heavenly bodies, such as the sun and the moon, and able to calculate even the diameters of the sun and the moon. And then at that time period, he was able to say, when will solar eclipses occur? Which, if you think about that, many of them felt that that was the gods being angry at them uh, to take away the sun. This was important for them to make that scientific uh, revelation. Now, other aspects that were important to Hipparchus was that the idea that a circle should be split into 360 degrees, which is what we do now, and that builds on some of the work of his uh, contemporaries, such as Aristosthenes. Additionally, he's one of the reasons why we use latitude and longitude to understand position with on the sphere, uh, especially on Earth, as that was something that was important to help him understand how to do the astronomy he worked on.